Thank you for clicking on the video. Here today, we're going to talk about my JBL 8340A speakers. And I'm doing this because in my most recent video, I touched on them just a little bit about how they were a really good value and how I was able to get uh, cheap items that were originally $50,000 in value for like a fraction of that cost here in my home theater. And I talked about my JBL speakers in that video, but I got some comments on that video uh, of people wanting to know more about those speakers, the specs and some different things. And honestly, I've never done that with them. Uh, so I thought, why not do that here today? So that is exactly what I'm gonna do. So here today, we're talking about my JBL 8340 speakers. I'm gonna give you some information about them and let you know why I feel like like they are one of the best values in home theater today uh, for surround sound speakers. So stay tuned. All right, so yeah, we are talking about my JBL 8340A speakers in a little bit more detail than what I did uh, in my previous videos. Now I do have two videos talking about these. They'll be linked either up here in the corner or linked at the end of the video here today. So if you wanna watch those, go ahead. Uh, but what I'm talking about here today, will have a little bit of kind of crossover with those uh, just briefly, but mainly I'm gonna be talking about the actual specs on these speakers and why I really think that these are some of the best value you can get in terms of surround speakers in your home theater here today. Now, very briefly on the history of these speakers. So these are the 8340A speakers. JBL, when they produced these surround sound speakers, produced different versions. Uh, these are, like I said, the 8340s. They originally, I believe, came out with an 8320 model, uh, which looks similar to these, had similar specifications. Then they came out with an 8330. Then they developed these, the 8340s. Uh, and then they developed an 8350, I believe. And then following the 8350, I believe they switched up their entire look and just a style of speaker for actual commercial theaters. And they changed them into a different product line. But these fall kind of right in the middle generations of uh, this version of JBL cinema speakers. Now, when you look online, you may see ones that look like this, that have these rubberized uh, frame and kind of cloth um, cover and stuff on here. They also made some wooden kind of framed oblong looking versions. Those pretty much came out first. So like this one, the 8340A, the A stands for this model. The wooden ones are a lot bigger and heavier than these. And there is some discourse online when you look at forums and different places about which versions sound better, the wooden versions of these speakers or these rubberized like plastic body uh, versions. I've never listened to the wooden ones, but I do know because they are much bigger, much heavier, a lot of people say that those give out a better bass response. Uh, just the way they're constructed just lend itself better to bass, where these are much better for the mid-range and like uh, higher ranges uh, on the actual, you know, sound reproduction. These speakers are no older than the 1980s, <laughs> mid 1980s, because all these speakers are THX certified. Uh, so they're made for THX cinema reproduction when THX was really like popular and really big into that in the actual commercial cinema market. So because of that, THX was initially released and rolled out in 1983. And that was kind of coinciding with the release of Return of the Jedi. And then it kind of took on its life of its own kind of after that to really be a standard for theater reproduction in both audio and visual quality to try and really maintain a high level of quality in what you were seeing in the cinemas. And so it kind of took on its own, its own life following that. But anyways, these could not be any older than like 1983, 84, 85 at the earliest, which I don't believe this version 
is that old. Uh, maybe some of the original 8320s or maybe even 8330s may stretch back that far. But at least for this model and then the 8350s that followed, uh, the earliest I think these could go back would be like the mid 90s, late 90s probably, uh, or potentially even into the early 2000s. Now, I may not know the actual manufacture date on these because for some reason there is no manufacturing date listed on the label on the back that you'll see pop in here. It just shows the serial number and the model number and some information about JBL, but it doesn't show a manufacturer date at all. But I do know from the spec sheet I found through the actual official JBL website for this model of speaker, that spec sheet had a date on it way down at the bottom of 2008. So these could be as late as maybe uh, the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s potentially. Uh, they could be as old as the mid to late 90s. I, I really don't know. Now for this one specifically, this one supposedly goes down to 45 hertz on the frequency response. However, I don't think that's the case. I mean, you may be able to stretch that down that far, but I don't think you're going to get much reproduction down uh, in that level. I have my AVR set to 80 hertz on the crossover, which is the THX standard. And since these are THX certified speakers, granted, I'm not using them in an actual commercial theater environment. I'm using them here in the home theater, but I figured that would be a good sweet spot for these. Uh, even though they are quite large, uh, I feel like that for the actual sound reproduction works best. These are 18 inches tall, so they're pr pretty tall. They are 18 inches wide, so they're basically a big square. And then on the thickness, I'll rotate this a little bit here so you can see. So at the thickest point up here, it's about 10 and a quarter inches thick. And then it kind of tapers down a little bit at the bottom uh, because this is the top, this is the bottom. And when you would sit it against the wall, it would be angled slightly. So in terms of like weight on these, the spec sheet lists them at 19 pounds and I don't have a scale down here to weigh these, but that feels about right. You know, 15 to 20 pounds probably seems about right for these speakers. They're pretty hefty and they come with this grill on top. Now, in order to remove this grill, you have to remove the screws that are all along the sides of the, the baffling here in order to remove it. If you just go in there and try and pop it off, it's not gonna go anywhere because it's screwed in. And when you take this off, you will see the actual driver uh, setup on these speakers. So in one of my earlier videos, I mentioned that the 8330 speakers are somewhat considered maybe the pinnacle by some uh, in the community of these style of speakers from JBL. And that's because those are three-way speakers. And to my knowledge, out of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s that JBL made, the 30s are the only ones that are three-way. Everything else is two-way. So that one would have a smaller woofer, a mid-range that would kind of sit in here as well, and then this horn-loaded compression driver on top. Now, these are not three-way, these are two-way, but the difference you get on these and the other models, not the 8330s, is that this comes with a 10-inch woofer here on it. So, you're, ideally, you would think you would get a lot of bass out of these, uh, which, like I said, they're rated to 45 hertz. I don't know how much reproduction you would get there if you really wanted to drive them down that low, but for me, still sitting them at 80, you still get a decent level of like mid bass out of here. And since these are not main channel speakers, I'm not using them as left and right or as center randomly. I'm using them strictly as surround speakers, which is what these were intended for. Uh, you really don't need a whole lot of that bass in there. I mean, it would be nice to have, I guess, to give you a little uh, richer, more full sound coming out of the surround field, but really you don't need it because most special effects and most dialogue and most of the action that you would see uh, in a feature film usually for the most part not it's not always the case but for the most part tends to stay relegated to the front stage now you will also notice outside of the 10 inch base that's on here base driver it has a one inch compression driver for the tweeter up at the top which this is the first speaker I've ever owned that had a compression driver in it, to my knowledge. So yeah, because of that, 
And because this is the only time I've listened to a compression driver, I don't have a whole lot to compare it to. But to me, these speakers are very clear uh, in the mid and upper ranges uh, when you listen to, to stuff. Now, again, these have always been set up at the rear of my room in this 5.1 setup. So they're not getting a whole ton of like crazy dynamic audio running through them uh, where they would if I had them maybe set up as my main channels. And so the audios to me always seemed very clear on these. And you've always been able to hear a lot of good uh, tonal directionality coming out of these. And I think that's also because this compression driver that's up here is a wide dispersion compression driver because since these are made to be in a large theater auditorium you know where you're going to have several dozens or several hundreds of people depending on the size of the theater these are made to really spread the sound out and really give you wide coverage uh, of the audio uh, because these are made for commercial theaters, commercial cinemas. So maybe a little bit overkill. You don't need as wide of a dispersion angle uh, in my room here because my space isn't, you know, gigantic by any uh, stretch. But you really do get a lot of good uh, directional tonality coming out of these. When you sit, especially in the first row up here, you can really tell uh, the direction. So if something pans around you, you can definitely hear if it's coming out of the left or the right speaker, uh, you know, behind you. So that's a, a real benefit of these. Because these are commercial cinema speakers, they're extremely high sensitivity. So they are very easy to drive. Uh, these speakers are 96 uh, dB sensitivity. So you do not need an overly powerful AVR to drive something like these. And that was a common misconception for me that I always had growing up, is I assumed if you had real theater speakers from a legit uh, theater, you know, commercial cinema, whatever, you had to have extremely high-end uh, equipment and technology to drive them, that you need a lot of power. And that's simply not the case. You can drive these on a very budget-friendly AVR. And that's the other thing, because these are commercial cinema speakers, you can pump a lot of power into these if you have them. I think they're rated up to 250 watts and up to like 1,000 watts peak uh, with 250 watts continuous coming through them because they are commercial-grade speakers made for a commercial theater. So if you have higher-end uh, equipment that can put out a lot of you know clean power to these they'll definitely take it and definitely give you a better you know sound out of that a more clear uh you know less distorted sound if you've got that power to kind of supply to them but for me my avr that i'm using my rotel maxes out at 100 watts but it can do 100 watts with every channel driven on it and that is more than enough to power these at the 96 sensitivity uh you can definitely get clear audio out of these uh, without any issues at 100 watts a channel. So now I flipped it over to the rear. Normally these speakers would be mounted with a JBL professional mounting like system, which is kind of like a triangular shape that fits right in this kind of slot right here. I'll throw a picture of it up on the video. And it's a two piece mounting system. You would slide one piece in, bolt it down, and then the other piece hooks into it and mounts to the wall. And it keeps everything at this fixed angle uh, that these are set at because normally these would be raised up pretty high on the theater walls and they kind of angle down to shoot down at the actual uh, crowd that, you know, audience that's sitting in there. Now that mounting system, honestly, even finding them used would cost more than these speakers that I bought. Now, sometimes you can find them uh, already attached when you buy these speakers. They'll already be mounted to the back or sometimes it'll be half. The mounting plate will be on here, but the other piece to the wall wouldn't be. Uh, and the way it looked, you might actually still be able to use that and just use the screw holes on the end of that piece to screw into your wall. I don't really know. I'm not 100% sure on that. But you can find the mounts uh, by themselves, but they're like 70 to to $100 a piece for one of those mounting brackets. And so that would be double what I paid for the set of the speakers if I was to buy two of them, because I only paid $70 for the pair of speakers. And so that would be $70 at the cheapest I've seen them for one mounting bracket. And so I didn't want to do that. And so what I ended up doing is I took a piece of the spare frame wood 
from my original theater screen that's behind the one that's up on the wall right now that I made earlier this year. Uh, I just took a small scrap piece. I just cut it to, I don't know what this is. This is like five or six inch like piece right here. Cut it, put it on here, screwed it in with two little bolts into the uh, frame back here. I made sure it was in a spot that wouldn't actually interfere with the components. Screwed it in and then I took these, which are just some leftover mounting brackets, uh, keyhole mounts from an old pair of Polk speakers I had here years ago in my home theater and just kept them uh, in like a spare parts uh, container of stuff I have laying around here. And so I screwed those into this piece of wood. So effectively what happens is to keep this angle kind of how it is. I just have a wall anchor put into the wall where they hang. I centered this and so they just kind of hook right in on this keyhole. And it still, when it sits flat, keeps the angle that these are supposed to be at. Because the normal mounting bracket would do the same thing. It slides in and then the other piece comes flat like this. So essentially, I'm maintaining the correct angle that you're supposed to get with speakers like these. One other thing you will notice here on the back of the speaker are the connections. They're at the very top of the speaker, as opposed to like a normal bookshelf or normal surround speaker that are generally placed maybe in the middle of the speaker or way down at the bottom. These are way up at the top, uh, which is really nice here for my space because I have this bracket set up and I've run all my speaker wire through my drop ceiling. So I just have two L-shaped banana plugs uh, connectors. I plug them in they go and make an L shape and then they go straight up into my drop ceiling. And it's just a very clean, easy connection. And then I can just hook this right on my wall anchor and we're good to go. So there you go. There's just the basic uh, specs and kind of dimensions and everything of these speakers. Uh, these are not the most dirt cheap speakers you're ever gonna find in the world, uh, even on the used market. You are gonna spend a little bit of money on them, but you can find some really good deals if you look hard enough. Like I said, I paid $70 for the pair of these, which is a really good deal. A lot of times online, you can find these for $50 to $70 a piece on like eBay. So if you were to buy two of them with shipping and stuff, it usually falls between like $100, $150. That's a pretty good deal. And to me, even at that price, but especially if you can get them for like $70 a pair like I did, I think they're one of the best pound for pound values that you can get for your home theater. Now, of course, there are always caveats with stuff like that. Depending on how you want your aesthetics to look, or if you have a significant other that has a preference on aesthetics, if you want like in-wall speakers or something that's very thin and slim to sit on your wall, these are not those speakers. These are big, they're bulky, they're gonna stick out and they're gonna, you know, be noticeable. You definitely are not gonna be able to hide these. But in terms of audio reproduction, again, you're not gonna get super deep bass levels. Uh, I mean, you might be able to really stretch it a little bit on there uh, with the specs on these. I've never had any need to do that. But you're gonna get really clear and very just tight uh, audio coming out of these. I've never heard these distort even when I've turned my volume up, you know, to max listening levels for what I can kind of bear here in my home theater. These have always been clear. They've had enough punch and enough kind of mid-range and mid-bass uh, to give you a decent enough, you know, kind of sound when there is something more action-oriented happening in the rear stage. But for most normal applications, you know, when you just hear little sound effects behind you or something panning around, this kind of just quick and goes around there. Unless it's a very action-oriented movie or something or a video game and you kind of spin your camera of the video game and just hold that audio to come out of these kind of speakers in the back, you're never going to really notice that these are kind of really performing here in my home theater at like 80 hertz. Uh, but like I said, these are probably, in my opinion, one of the best values you can get. And that's especially if you're looking to recreate real cinema quality, a real cinematic experience in your home theater. Just go for the real thing and put it in there if you've got the space to do it because you will be pleasantly surprised uh, with the value you can get out of these. 
and because they're real cinema quality speakers, they may look beat up like these have some scratch marks and some paint and stuff on them from the theater that they were pulled out of. But these are constructed really well and they're made to last because these are made to run for many hours a day, seven days a week, almost 365 uh, in a year, you know, for years and years. So these are made to last. And so for me, like I said, these are some of the best quality, best budget uh, you know, pound for pound speakers you're going to get. And that falls to any of the speakers in this model line, not just the 8340s. I think the 8320s through the 8350s, any one of them you wanted to buy would be a good value if you can find a good deal on them. And so with that, we're going to wrap this video up. Definitely uh, comment down below if you've used speakers like this or if you have thought about getting commercial theater speakers in your home theater or if you actually have them already. Definitely consider liking and subscribing, all that good YouTuber stuff that everyone always asks you to do. If you do enjoy my content, consider doing that. I have almost 100 videos now on my channel, which is crazy to think. I'm going to say goodbye uh, for this video. Thanks again. And I will see you the next time in the next video right here on Secondhand Home Theater. Thank you.